Heading into the Age of Reformation, England has a bit of a rough patch to get through. The slight hit to religious unity and negative to heretic tolerance could be a problem, but ultimately, a reduction in stability isn't too big of a deal. With how much manpower and money we've got, putting down rebellions shouldn't be too difficult. Instead, the mentality of England with regards to European religious tension is to take a bit of a vacation. While the Europeans fight amongst themselves over the nature of worshipping God, England will go around Africa and find a route to India. That being said, England does owe obligations to its continental allies, like Austria, but the French crown will essentially take care of any continental issues, as England has no interest. The nice thing about bisecting England's domain between the French and English is the ability to delegate. It's always attractive in Parliament during issues of war to just pawn off unattractive military responsibilities to the Duchy of France. For that reason, you won't be seeing much of Europe this episode. Let's sail around Africa and let the spice flow. Okay, so I know I just said we'd be ignoring Europe, but I kind of lied. There are two major acquisitions on the table first for the problem to discuss. The Crown of Portugal and some annoying Provençal lords complaining about the rightful claims of their deceased King René. While normally petty lords of realms no longer relevant to the kingdom would be ignored, these Provençal lords have offered to put their reputations on the line. If they are granted a charter over Maine, they will present their claims to the traditional Provençal home of Toulon and the throne of Naples. With that proposal, the deposed nobles were granted a throne, and the alliance with the Pope was broken given that he ruled the seat of Provençal power. This break in relations between England and the Papal State will certainly set a precedent for future decisions. War broke out and Avignon was invaded by English troops. What had been a friendly relationship was broken over a loss of trust in Papal authority and, to be frank, secular greed. In the meantime, Henry York, of the Portuguese cadet branch, is without an heir. First of all, using the favours England earned by helping with the conquest of Tunis, Portugal's alliance with Spain will be shattered. Right afterwards, the alliance was broken and the throne claimed. It was also during the war with the Papal States that religion came to the forefront of English thought. For many people, it was quite an affront to God to fight the Pope, but discussions over papal corruption and the role of Christ's vicar in worldly politics were beginning in this era of Reformation. To represent this, I took religious ideas. I'm mostly doing this because I'm planning to go Anglican and having a Holy War CB on literally everyone on the planet is pretty nice, I won't lie. After announcing the claim to Portugal, Provence was granted Corsica, and with that got cores on all of Naples thanks to their mission tree. Provence is one of the few nations which simply generates cores on another nation with its missions. I'm going to push those cores and get a nice chunk of land in Italy for basically no aggressive expansion. Unfortunately, during the war against Naples, the Yorkist heir in Spain was removed from the court, most likely on account of a fear that England would claim Spain's throne too. That being said, it was quite the insult for the York heir to be removed, and although Spain claims he passed away of a hunting accident, the royalty knows the truth. Regardless, the King of England died during the Naples War and was succeeded by Charles I of York, who took a pro-papist stance only because, although diplomacy broke down, England's ties to the church still carry some meaning. Anyway, the conflict in Naples has ended, with all but the city of Napoli itself falling under Promosol control. Meanwhile, colonial ventures in East Africa and South Africa are quickly expanding. England's involvement in European affairs is starting to cool off, with only Portugal being on the agenda and perhaps the final conquest of Napoli. Following anti-papist sentiment from the recent war, questions about the church's role in English society became more and more prominent, with Charles I choosing to found the Anglican Church in response to these questions. The only religious authority in the blossoming English Empire will be the monarch, and that's that. I completed the piety of the state mission after becoming defender of the faith, and that gives a new government reform which is pretty good. I also got the English Renaissance, which makes it so that when you're employing an artist, you get an idea cost reduction. It's actually pretty nice, but knowing me, I'll be too lazy to micromanage it and end up paying full cost for ideas anyway. Unfortunately for me, Spain got an heir before I could get another York for them, so it looks like my union on the rest of Iberia may have to wait. Perhaps I'll even just conquer them, but I'm not going to bird it just because it'll feel kind of unfair to bird so hard. I already birded in the Castile Guide. Thankfully, Portugal continues to exist without an heir, so I'm pretty sure I'll be able to get them at least. Speaking of which, the truce is up, and in 1527, the English Royal Navy sailed for Lisbon. The Anglo-Portuguese alliance will finally be perfectly solidified with a union between the crowns. Meanwhile, down in South Africa, I've been using England's unique ability to choose the production goods of colonies to make gold and gems in the Cape. It costs some money and administrative points to make this much gold, but I want South Africa to really prosper. I'm going to drop some trade company investments there to make even more gold. After a couple years of occupation in Portugal, the York family took the crown and began working on fixing relations between the nations. With the long history between Portugal and England, it should be easy enough to repair things. With these European affairs complete, English explorers became the forefront of politics. India has been discovered, as has Australia. The only question now is figuring out the best way to exploit these discoveries, and in particular, India. India is a place of much myth and legend, but what's more, it's a place of much trade and wealth. 
Although the English are foreign to India, their desire to unite the subcontinent and exploit its riches is quite a native sentiment. England has a very interesting mission for India, which gives them cores when they discover the region. I'm not quite ready to attack India yet though, considering Vijayanagar is pretty strong and I don't have a nearby port to get my troops organized in. The nice thing about the free cores on India is that no matter your colonial range, you can always take cores. The only problem is my navies will take attrition going that far from any home ports, and my men on the boats take attrition at sea on the way there, so I'm going to wait until I have a nearby island to congregate and repair on. By the time I was ready, I got pretty lucky with random cores. I got a core on an independent Andhra, which means I can at least get one core province in India for basically free, and that makes invading the rest of India much easier. When I conquered Andhra, I got the East Indies mission, which lets me essentially make a colonial nation in India. Now look, I want to try it out and see what the subject even is, so I spawned it, but I'm going to be honest with you. Throughout the run, I only regretted making this subject. It's just a colonial subject, that's all it is. The East India Company will only give you one merchant, while being able to just take all of India yourself as your own cores will give you many merchants if you make them all trade companies. To be fair, I'm not certain if there are more events or anything that happen if you give more land to the East India Company. For all I know, there's more to it, and if you know anything about it, feel free to comment it and I'll pin it if you got good info. But from what I understand, it's literally just a colonial nation, meaning I'd rather directly control everything. If you pick the option to create the EIC, it'll give claims to your subject and not to you, which means I did mess up by making the EIC. Claims reduce core cost and core time, and that's going to become very relevant very soon, as my hunger for India will not be easily satiated. With that aside, I immediately attacked Vijayanagar with a Holy War CB before it went away. Since I made the subject there, I don't technically border them anymore, but I declared the war before our status as neighbors updated. This opponent is not a complete pushover, but they have very little manpower, which means I could just tire them out and fight even losing battles to eventually win the war. By the way, small bug showcase here. In the current patch of the game, the colonial interactions you can do with subjects, including the EIC, actually give admin points rather than taking them. This allows you to infinitely generate admin points as long as you have money. I'm showing it here and gave myself a free 60-ish points as a demonstration, but I will not be taking advantage of this bug to conquer India since as much as these videos RP, I do put a little guide spin on them. With some small skirmishes in Coromandel, news reached the armies in India that the king died and now Queen Margaret I rules England. She will presumably continue her predecessor's ambitions for Indian dominance. With trade in the east beginning, I got the coffee boom event which gives a great chunk of change and an increase to coffee prices. As well, my truce with Naples is done so I'm going to complete my conquest, or rather, Provence's reconquest. I'll let France handle that while I focus on India. Vijayanagar has fallen and now I just need to backtrack and win battles for war score. One thing about holy wars that can be annoying is how most of your war score will come from battles. It makes wars take a long time. I thought this war would be harder to be honest, but it turns out that our tech differences make these battles pretty trivial, and alongside the manpower shortage, these guys are done. In 1540, a peace treaty was signed, giving control of a large part of the Coromandel to the EIC, and leaving the fort north of Aranaki to England. The idea behind this is to let me keep holy warring by holding just a tiny sliver of land in the area. Right after the treaty with Vijayanagar, war was declared on the Bahmanis, who at first were happy to see their Hindu rivals defeated. Little did they know that these Angreji traders were looking to trade blows, not goods. Using the spy network I've been building up, I stole some maps and now these wars are much more comfortable. Fighting in constant terra incognita can be scary since armies could be lurking anywhere. But to be honest, with how strong I am compared to even the biggest Indian powers, it's not really all that important. This war went about the same as the war with Vijayanagar and a treaty was signed in 1543 giving even more land to the company and saving a small section in the east for the English to border Bengal. Speaking of which, Bengal is the next target. I'd cover these wars a bit more, but they're just not really all that interesting. The strategy is to have one army sieging forts and another just hunting armies down. This way you can get ticking war score from battles with the Holy War CB, but still be sieging and getting fort war score. If you can do both simultaneously, the war goes much faster. In 1545, I got a government reform where I could pick between direct royal administration and parliamentary administration, and I'll be frank, the direct administration is pretty much just better if you ask me. Anything that gives core cost reduction is just too good, and given that I'll be conquering a ton of India in the near future, that small core creation reduction is going to save hundreds of points. In 1547, Bengal surrendered a huge swath of land, including the Delta, and with that, England and its company have divided up most of eastern India's coastline between themselves. It was also at this point that I became an empire. Because I created the East India Company, all the missions give their claims to the company and not me. Oh well, for your run, just don't bother with the company. Taking the time to look around the map a little, things seem to be going mostly normally. The only big difference is that Spain is taking the majority of North America since I am not there to contest them. My plan is to eventually conquer Spain, either through outright conquest or the Union eventually. Right now, it's looking like it'll be a conquest given that they have heirs constantly. Denmark has also found their way into Canada and I'm debating if I'll bother fighting them for it or not. 
The big reason to fight Denmark is for control of Lubeck, which would increase my trade income a lot, but to be honest, I make so much money right now that I don't even need more. That being said, is there such a thing as enough money? In terms of my own internal affairs, I'm using the Anglican buttons to strip the clergy of land and to get money in mercantilism. I should be able to hit 100 mercantilism pretty quickly if I keep clicking the Anglican money button, which will be pretty nice. I'm going to be controlling trade pretty effectively regardless of my mercantilism just based on my land share, but anything helps. As expected, the printing press spawned in 1550, and I finished coring Bengal. I founded some universities in Oxford, giving me the symposium events, which are just little modifiers that come up each decade. I built up a huge trade fleet and sent it off to Lubeck to suck up all the trade power from Denmark. This will enrich me as well as impoverishing them. Never underestimate the power of 50 light ships and their ability to completely dominate a trade node by themselves. I went from 27% trade control to 47% in one move, while having not a single province in the Lubeck trade node. Right on cue, my truce with Vijayanagar ended, and that means war is back on the menu. I don't have a border with them anymore, but I can still declare war using the EIC's claims. I can also try and get my free cores back, which I can use for a border to get holy wars. I also landed in Australia with my first colony down in Esperance. A very French sounding name, kind of cringe, England. I attacked a couple of the tiny central Indian tribes who had no allies and just conquered them quickly. English Bengal is expanding pretty nicely. Simultaneously, the Australian Aboriginals have got to go, since all they do is drag the performance of the game down, similarly to North American natives. Yeah, I'm just going to co-belligerent everyone in Australia, pretty sure I can beat them all. The only question is if I'll have the patience to micromanage separate pieces with all of them. For my war with Vijayanagar, I'm going to try and steal all their forts to make future wars easier. At least I was going to do that, but to be honest, I didn't want the horrible border gore. I can't do it. I know what I must do, but I do not have the strength to do it. Instead, I'm going to just grab the entire coastline except Sri Lanka. Next up, of course, is the Bahmanis again. I'll be declaring war on Chanda and making their larger protector a co-belligerent. Meanwhile, in Australia, I'm slowly sweeping through the southwest, up and around to the north, and I'll head into the northeast soon. A war with the Bahmanis is ending now, and I'm going to do some kind of cringe border gore this time since I couldn't on Vijayanagar. I'm just going to delay the peace until at least a few of my cores are done because I'm about to hit some pretty high overextension. Even with all these cores waiting to finish, my conquests will not be slowed. Sindh is next, and they're added with the Ottomans and Delhi. I guess this will be our first war with the Ottomans then. I'm going to call in Spain and Austria to handle the Turks while I focus on Sindh and Delhi. This war with the Ottomans, Delhi, and Sindh is pretty big, although it's in very British fashion that I'll be picking on the small guys while my allies and subjects go and die in the field at the hands of the real enemies. By the way, I forgot to mention earlier, but yeah, I didn't have the patience to go and annex all the Australian natives. I just took the bits and pieces I'd occupied and called it a day. I really don't need Australia. Okay, back to the actually interesting wars. I'm pretty sure Austria, Spain, and France can handle the Ottomans on their own, but funnily enough, Delhi is kind of big. They're behind on tech, but they do have a pretty big army. That being said, I can afford to grind my men down and lose manpower. They really can't. The first casualty of the war was Tafalot, which lost their gold mine to Portugal. I'm losing some battles in Gujarat, but that's only temporary. That manpower is never coming back. Also, I'm on Delhi, and it's about to fall. I'm probably just going to white piece Delhi to get them out of the war with a short truce so I can focus on Sindh. That is indeed exactly what I did, as Delhi exited the war. The real question is what to do with the Ottomans. My allies and subjects have taken Constantinople, and well, I want to cripple the Ottomans. What better way to destroy them than to take the gem of their empire? I'm taking Constantinople, and I'm taking control of the Straits. I didn't quite get Gallipoli since Austria occupied it, but I've got the important trade centers of Hudevendigar, Karasi, and Constantinople, alongside the other end of the Bosporus and Kojeli. The Treaty of the Straits meant that the Ottomans were officially bisected, and although they've been a little declawed, they're still quite the lion to contend with. With all of their allies out of the war, Sindh is alone in this war, and I'm going to wait to peace out until I've reduced by overextension a bit more. I'm waiting for the cores, but that doesn't mean I'm done being at war. I'm going to war with Bengal again, and I'm going to try and grab everything up into Assam so I can cut Bengal off from its land in Burma. I made peace with Sindh, taking all of Gujarat, and once again throwing my nation into massive turmoil over my overextension. I can handle it though, I have manpower and money, what more do I need? I can hire mercenaries as I need to take down rebels, and I can keep fighting wars without worrying about my army dwindling. I'm also going to war with Delhi, who has no real allies now, and I'm pretty much just going to rotate truces between each of the Indian sultanates to have taken what's left of India. I've grabbed the rest of central India off of Bengal, and now the border gore is starting to resolve. It looks almost pretty, but there's still lots of beautification to be done. Unfortunately, my overextension is super high now, and the bad events are going to start pouring in. Delhi is actually putting up a pretty strong fight, but they'll eventually run out of manpower. In 1571, I grabbed diplomatic ideas which I'm planning to use for the idea that gives province war score cost. I also grabbed the Royal Charters Government Reform, which lets me make trade protectorates. I'm not sure what those do, but I'll make a few and see what exactly they're good for. Anyway, the Delhi War is over, and I'm going to just push the border forward. 
I could have tried to be smarter about grabbing forts or really push into the rich provinces to weaken them, but I just want pretty borders, okay? With that conquest, England's really feeling the heat now, and some in the parliament are thinking that all this reckless conquest may catch up to the empire in due time. The foothold England has made here in India is quickly turning into a lot more than just a couple outposts and trade cities. Instead, England has quickly become the most powerful nation in all of India, despite being foreign to the region. You might say that this was upsetting to the Indian people who had previously been happy to bicker amongst themselves. There's nothing more strongly unifying than a foreign invader, and that meant rebellion was coming. Although it would begin with just a few rebel groups in far-flung regions of the empire, those small groups may develop into much larger revolts against the crown. Knowing that maintaining order wouldn't be easy and that the remaining Indian powers would need to be decisively crushed, the crown employed like five people named Jonathan Bedford and another five guys named David Clarence to lead the armies that would wipe out these rebels. Most of them were fired for not being skilled enough to handle the unconventional warfare of the region, but the short list of generals to handle the rebellion became Richard Drake, Richard Norfolk, David Clarence, Jonathan Bedford, Nehemia Button, and Jonathan Bedford's quantum twin, Jonathan Bedford. These men would form the Royal War Council of the Indies, as they worked with the merchants of the East India Company to map the region and secure the land. The Indians heard of this new council and began assembling weapons to rebel against their overlords with. The Gujaratis and Malvans rose up, even despite the internal tension, the need for Indian territory would not be quenched. Vijayanagar, who had heard of all the rebellions, assumed it was safe from invasion. They were wrong. As treaties were being drawn up to divide Vijayanagar, war with the last Shia Sultan of India began and more rebels rose up. In 1580, the Bahmanis were defeated and finally annexed and more rebels rose up. Nonetheless, Sindh was next. Even with all that Deccan overextension, the Indus must be secured. The same goes for Bengal, who controls much of the holiest Indian rivers. Also, small note. Austria called me into a war against Ragusa, and I realized at that moment that Sindh and Ragusa share the exact same flag for some reason. Kinda funny. Sindh was fully annexed, putting the Timurids and England at odds, although I don't think anyone doubts that England is the one who will be taking India. For the war with Bengal, I chose to drag the war out to at least core a little bit, since my overextension was getting pretty high, but at the same time, wouldn't it be kinda fun to go kinda crazy with the overextension? After Bengal, I was at 150%, but Delhi's truce was over, and this momentum could not be allowed to dissipate. Delhi is a shadow of its glory now, and the war went quickly as Delhi fell. Again, I pushed the border further north, taking all the way up to Delhi, but not quite taking Delhi itself. I didn't even bother waiting for cores this time. It would be ungentlemanly to keep an opponent at war who has clearly surrendered, and England needs to start living some of its ideals. It's 1591, and most of India is conquered now. There's still most North India and Punjab to conquer, and my governing capacity can't even support all this land. I'm at almost 300% overextension, and now questions of how to hold this land together are really coming to the forefront of even Parliament back in England. There are some anti-imperialist factions in the Parliament who border on treason now infesting England, inciting rebellion even back home. Nonetheless, what remains of Vijayanagar must go. India must be united. The rebellions on India are starting to look pretty scary, even with the Great English War Council, but the Jonathan Bedford twins are ready to take them down. With one more treaty signed and another land acquisition, England in 1592 has declared itself the master of India. This mission gives you a reduction to minimum autonomy in territories, which includes trade companies, meaning all this land in India is now even more valuable. What's more though is that the map looks kinda nice. Previously the border war was quite ugly, but now it's a relatively okay looking India. I just need to take Sri Lanka and the city of Vijayanagar itself and I'll be perfect. Later on I can even take the rest of India. By the way, this mission makes your commercial protectorates give you minus 75% trade penalty on trade nodes that aren't your home node. And I suppose that's the reason to make the EIC, but I'm not sure that's worth it. It's at least more of a reason to make the EIC. They also get a goods produced bonus, but I'd rather just hold all of India myself than let my subject get a goods produced bonus. Anyway, India has been mastered, but the unrest that Parliament predicted has arrived. The people of the subcontinent were once divided and squabbling, but now are united in their desire to see freedom from the English invaders. Where is the freedom? When the English landed in the Coromandel all those years ago, they came as traders and liberators. They came with new technology and a better standard of living. They came promising to free Hindus from Muslims and to free Muslims from Hindus. One of the only words these Englishmen knew in Hindi was Azad, because every time they said it, smiles came about. It was clear now that the English had no understanding of Azad. They were conquerors, not liberators. They were exploiters and colonizers, not migrants. Anti-English propaganda across India spread between people of all languages, faiths, and ideologies. England was overextended and vulnerable. They could barely hold on to the land they had, and the only thing in the way of Indian freedom is the English War Council of the Indies. Will England exit the Age of Reformation while maintaining its grip on India, or will India slip through the cracks? Let's see. Most of the opening rebellions are in the northwest of India, with a couple small ones out in the northeast. 
There are two armies currently hunting rebels down, and for now, England has both the manpower and money to keep the armies supplied and paid. Morale is high. Overextension is at 369%, and admin points are low. Somehow, even rebels in Ireland have heard of England's time of weakness, and traitorous elements in the Emerald Isle are rising up alongside the Indians, as more and more rebels across Coromandel and the Deccan are rising up. The rebels have been put down, mostly in the east, but in the west, forts are falling, and larger and larger armies are stacking together. Meanwhile, Protestant rebels, who don't like the Anglican Church's secular woes, have taken up arms outside the Tower of London. The English armies are too busy in India to come back. To help keep the Indian rebels down, the Free Company was hired, which hurt England's professionalism a bit, but they needed the help. The English manpower can't reach its units in India fast enough to reinforce before more rise up, and admin points need to come in fast to get this land cord. The armies swept through the north and northeast, liberating Multan and Rajasthan from rebel control. In 1594, most of the rebels were defeated, leaving India looking pretty good, but that was just round one of the rebels. That surely can't be the end of them. Overextension is still at 282% and admin points are still lacking. Back home in London, the Protestants did manage to storm the capital and forcefully convert the people of London to Protestantism. Although perhaps a little unchristian to use violence, they are portrayed it as righteous fury against unjust rulership, making London a bastion of Protestant belief in a sea of Anglicanism. Another mercenary group was hired in Oxford to take care of reclaiming the capital. At this point, it looks pretty clear that the rebels have been put down, as even minor rebels off in West Africa have been ruthlessly crushed. While the need for administrative power to continue quarreling is still a major issue, things have calmed down across the empire. In order to reduce the province governing cost of the empire, I started building state houses across the empire both at home and overseas. It's expensive, but if I can get my governing costs below the cap, I can spend fewer points on cores since being over the cap reduces administrative efficiency. By 1598, the overextension is back down to 139%. And with a little more reduction, we can get below 100% and basically secure the empire completely. Indeed, in 1599, just before global trade spawned, I got overextension to 87%, meaning all those bad events are over. There may still be some minor separatist movements around, but they won't be on any scale comparable to the Azad riots of just a few years earlier. The successful domination of India is a huge moment in both English and Indian history, and given that India now composes the vast majority of England's development, the question only becomes one of how much India will influence England alongside England's influence on India. With India conquered, England is going to calm down. There may be a few more minor conquests in the next decade, but with global trade spawning in the English Channel, England is entering a new era of economic power and political absolutism. A large part of controlling the empire is going to be stamping down other rebellious elements, and continuing to conquer other nations in the vicinity will certainly be on the Parliament's mind. During the Azad riots of the 1590s, though, there was one nation that showed a lot of insolence in England's time of weakness. It was mostly ignored for more important issues, but it turns out that Spain had broken diplomatic ties with England, perhaps over their mass expansionism off in India or perhaps out of some misplaced sense of grandeur. The Spanish may have just made, perhaps, the biggest mistake of their lives with that, and although England is still very much so recovering from their problems in the East, why should things calm down too much? There are truces with the Indian Sultanates to wait out, and while waiting, Spain ought to be put in their place, finally. First, they got rid of the York family, and they broke the alliance. This cannot be forgiven. 70,000 Englishmen landed in Laborde, and a holy war to purge heresy from Spain was started. The Spaniards would kiss Queen Margaret's boot, or they would die. They chose death. First off, the fort in Navarra. English cannon shot down the walls and the men charged in. English manpower is plenty high and there's no reason to be reserved. With that fort down, Madrid was besieged and the various subjects of the English Empire flooded into the Castilian hills and valleys. Given that this war was basically a representation of Anglicanism against Catholicism, the Pope was in this war too and he would be punished for his involvement. Spain was fully occupied at this point, but they're holding on because of the New World, which is where most of Spain's power sits. Fortunately for England, the Spanish were willing to surrender, and although Spain was expecting a seriously punishing treaty, England instead chose to take most of what Spain might consider its non-core territories. Places like Sicily and the Mediterranean Islands. England took Navarra and Rusalon, ruining all the defensive points for Spain that kept England away from the heart of their nation. This outcome was certainly scary for Spain, but little did they know, they were not yet safe. Provence was granted the Mediterranean Islands to govern except Malta, which England personally held, and the Beleries and Rusalon were given to France. With the lands divided between the subjects, England would normally be honest about its treaties and respect truces out of the chivalrous gentleman culture of England's lordship. Unfortunately for Spain, the English are kinda mad about the whole York affair from before, and for that reason, the truce was thrown out. War has broken out once again. This truce-breaking policy may or may not have been influenced by the up-and-coming statesman Machiavelli, whose thought infiltrated England's administration in preparation for the upcoming Age of Absolutism. Simultaneously, the war to finish off the conquest of Vijayanagar broke out. That war was very quick, and India's borders look quite pretty now. Back to Spain. Things are going the same as the last war. Now Spain will face the horrific treaty they were expecting before. The entire country is being cut in half from Cantabria down to Granada. 
Portugal gets to govern most of Andalusia except Granada, and England will continue to rule in the north. After that war, Margaret finally passed away, having accomplished more in her lifetime than any other English monarch to date. She conquered India, took Constantinople, and even defeated Spain before her death, leaving the throne to Henry VIII, who's quite the competent king himself. With the final conquest, the Age of Reformation is coming to a close. War between Anglicans and Catholics in Iberia ended with an Anglican victory, and Anglican missionaries will quickly spread the faith across England's vast empire. There are two more years till the Age of Absolutism, but the rest of this age is just sitting and waiting for chorus until it ends. In 1610, this is England. What they lost in terms of control in the New World, they gained in India and Iberia. For future ambitions, it's hard to say where they'll go since they can go in basically any direction, but most likely the rest of Iberia and the New World will be England's new focus. Stealing all the colonies from Spain would certainly cement England's power, but taking all that land from Spain may take some time. Thankfully, with absolutism coming, it won't take that long once England reaches maximum absolutism. One thing I'm considering is if I should go into Japan and China, or the Middle East, or both. Could there just be a world conquest? What tag do I form? Not sure. There are so many options in England, and I'll be considering them in the Age of Absolutism as we march towards the Age of Revolution. By the way, that's the video. You can expect further parts for Castile and England, as well as a third new campaign coming very soon. If you want to join a CK3 multiplayer game, by the way, I know it's an EV4 video, but you never know, uh, check out my Discord. I'm hosting a game on Thursdays, so you can check that out in the Discord. Thank you for your time.